New York City's finest showed up today to pay respect to one of the greatest detectives in NYPD history, Joseph Coffey, taking down La Cosa Nostra Mafia, John Gotti, Paul Castellano. Big Joe was larger than life. He had a 140 IQ and a photographic memory. The bad guys were no match for him. Detective Joseph Coffey tightened the handcuffs around Gotti's wrists. As the cold metal clicked into place, Joe Coffey felt an unexpected weight in his hand. Astonished, he discovered a sleek black pistol concealed within Gotti's coat. This is the legendary tales of Joseph J. Coffey, the indomitable NYPD detective whose name struck fear into the hearts of criminals. From locking up John Gotti three times to catching the 44 caliber killer, aka the son of Sam, Joe Coffey's journey unfolds as a gripping tale of resilience, unwavering commitment to justice, and the harsh realities of betrayal. Beginnings. In 1940s New York City, young Joseph J. Coffey, or known to his friends as Joe, was raised in a family entrenched in the Teamsters Labor Union. His father, deeply involved, faced violence from the mobsters seeking to infiltrate the union. So that meant Joe grew up watching his father's resilience against the mob. The Coffey family's courage and integrity became etched in Joe's memory during a fateful incident in 1946. At the age of eight, Joe faced the harsh realities of organized crime when labor racketeers led by the infamous John Cockeye Dunn attempted to attack his family. The motive behind his brazen act was clear. His family was resisting corrupting influence of organized crime within the union. Joe Coffey saw his father's struggles against the organized crime during his childhood, which influenced his passion for fighting against criminal elements. As the years rolled on, Joe Coffey's journey took him through the corridors of education and into the heart of law enforcement. Armed with a master's degree in management and a burning desire to combat organized crime, Joe's career in the New York City Police Department took flight in 1964. His early days in the force saw him fight against criminal takeovers of legitimate businesses in the Manhattan District Attorney's Rackets Bureau. Joe's determination and dedication to dismantling the Mafia's influence earned him recognition paving the way for his ascent in the world of law enforcement. In 1978, a pivotal moment arrived in Joe Coffey's career. His longtime acquaintance, Chief of Detectives James Sullivan, extended an intriguing proposition. Sullivan, trusting Joe's experience and dedication, appointed him to lead the Chief of Detectives Organized Crime Homicide Task Force. The task force had a singular mission, to address the surge of mafia-related murders that plagued New York City. Joe Coffey embraced the challenge with enthusiasm, viewing it as a significant and demanding task. Grateful for the opportunity, Joe's commitment to the cause was fueled by his early exposure to the struggles his family faced against organized crime. As he delved into the world of the OCTF, Joe sought to assemble a team that shared his values of loyalty and integrity. Recognizing the sensitivity and potential danger of their mission, he emphasized the importance of selecting detectives who would stand steadfast in the face of adversity. Under Joe Coffey's leadership, the OCTF embarked on a journey to dismantle the organized crime in New York City. Drawing from his experience and resilience, Joe instilled a sense of mission in his team. They weren't just solving cases, they were waging a war against the organized crime that had once threatened the very fabric of Joe's family. The Coffey Gang, as they became known, adopted unconventional and aggressive tactics. Joe's hands-on approach included personally confronting uncooperative witnesses, earning him a reputation for what his colleagues fondly called Coffey's Martial Law. His commitment extended to staying ahead of the curve in investigative technologies, actively engaging in wiretapping and electronic surveillance. The OTF's strategy focused on showcasing their effectiveness by swiftly solving two key cases. Joe strategically assigned his detectives to investigate the murders of Leo Leidenhauf, a roofing contractor with ties to organized crime, and Salvatore, Sally Balls, Bergoglio, a figure connected to the Teamsters Union and the Mafia. Within three weeks, the Coffee Gang achieved remarkable progress in the Leidenhauf case, revealing ties to the Genovese family. Simultaneously, they delved into the Bergoglio case, targeting witnesses with potential links to the powerful Mafia figures. Joe Coffey's leadership style shattered traditions and challenged bureaucratic norms. He led a team that wasn't afraid to confront the powerful forces that pulled the strings. In his fight with the Mafia, Joe viewed their high-ranking members as foolish, considering himself and his team more intelligent. 
Despite facing resistance and challenges, Joe Coffey's OTCF left an indelible mark. And so the story of Joe Coffey continues. Vatican Connections in 1970, Joe Coffey stood at the forefront of an investigation that had grappled with the Vatican. Coffey was a seasoned detective under the district attorney, Frank Hogan. The tale began when Coffey found himself immersed in a case that transcended beyond the New York City, leading him across the Atlantic to Munich. A powerful mobster named Vincent Rizzo became the focal point of Coffey's pursuit. A man with the history of drug trafficking, counterfeit money, and stolen securities. As the investigation unfolded, a connection to the halls of the Vatican was found. Rizzo's criminal activities reached into the heart of one of the most revered institutions on the planet. In a bid to unravel the truth, Coffey designed a daring plan to travel to Munich, where he orchestrated a ruse involving arms deals for the Protestants in Northern Ireland. This was done with the support of Hogan, the district attorney who recognized the potential to override bureaucratic hurdles. Stepping onto foreign soil, Coffey collaborated with local detectives. He secured permission for wiretapping and eavesdropping, essential tools, and his specialty to expose the crimes of Rizzo. Coffey unearthed a vast criminal network with international ties, implicating individuals like Alfred Barg and Wilfred Entz, who had connections to the Italian Mafia. The narrative took an unexpected turn when discussions veered towards a deal involving counterfeit securities and connections to the Vatican. A significant revelation came to light. A plan orchestrated by Cardinal Eugene Tisserand and supported by Archbishop Paul Marcinkus to purchase $950 million in counterfeit U.S. corporate bonds. This revelation angered Coffey, as he was a devout Catholic himself and was determined to expose the priests. Representatives from Washington embarked on a journey to the Vatican, armed with evidence presented by Coffey and his team. However, Vatican and the Church refused to acknowledge the implications of the presented proof. Frustrated by the lack of progress and unable to pursue charges against Archbishop Paul Marcinkus, Coffey experienced a career shift, leaving the DA's squad, and embraced the role as a patrol sergeant in East Harlem's 25th Precinct. Meanwhile, the Italian police initiated their own investigations into the crimes of Michel Sindona, also known as the God's Banker, as he handled the Pope's finances. This investigation by the Italian police accused the Vatican Bank and Archbishop Paul Marcinkus of looting $1.2 billion from Banco Ambrosiano, the Italian bank. The accusation led to the Archbishop voluntarily resigning from his Vatican duties in 1990. The Vatican repaid a substantial amount to the Central Bank of Italy, but the acknowledgement of wrongdoing remained elusive. But Coffey's connection to the Vatican didn't end there. In a surprise twist of fate, Coffey became a key player during Pope John Paul's visit to New York in 1979. The man who once delved into the murky world of crime linked to the Vatican now found himself serving as a bodyguard for the Pope. Son of Sam in the late 1970s, Joe Coffey found himself thrust into the heart of one of the most notorious criminal investigations in New York City's history, the hunt for the son of Sam, a renowned serial killer. With 13 years of experience on the force, Coffey, a seasoned detective sergeant, had primarily dealt with professional criminals who operated behind the scenes. However, the son of Sam case would bring him face to face with the reality of a killer who struck fear into the hearts of city residents. It all began with a seemingly ordinary case, a murder investigation in Forest Hills, Queens. A 26-year-old Wall Street secretary named Christine Freund had been tragically shot while sitting in a car with her boyfriend, John Deal. Little did Coffey or the New York City know that this case would unravel into a series of murders that would grip the entire city in terror. As Coffey delved into the investigation, he received crucial information from the ballistic expert George Simmons. The 44 caliber bullet used in Freund's murder was identified as rare, and Simmons believed it matched bullets from other unsolved cases. This revelation led Coffey to a theory. A serial killer, armed with a 44 caliber Charter Arms Bulldog handgun, was on the loose in New York City. Armed with this theory, Coffey faced an uphill battle in convincing his superiors, including Captain Joe Borelli, of the existence of a serial killer. Skepticism lingered, but Coffey's determination prevailed, and an informal task force consisting of about 15 detectives and squad commanders was formed to investigate the potential serial killer. The urgency of investigating escalated when another victim fell prey to the killer, Virginia Voskaritian. 
Coffey felt a personal connection to the case as he thought about his own daughter, Kathleen, who was close in age to the victims. The pressure intensified, and Coffey found himself emotionally invested in solving the case. The investigation, however, was far from straightforward. Leads proved elusive, and the task force faced challenges in deciphering the killer's modus. Coffey collaborated with fellow detectives as they navigated the complex web of the serial killer's actions. Coffey's leadership style shone through during this challenging period. Described as a dedicated and hard-working detective, he expected the same level of commitment from his team. The detectives worked tirelessly, conducting interviews with victims' families, exploring potential motives, and piecing together the puzzle that would lead them to the elusive killer. The toll of the investigation extended beyond the professional realm. Coffey and his team faced personal sacrifices and emotional exhaustion. The city was gripped by fear, and the detectives were at the forefront, grappling with the enormity of their task. Despite the challenges, Coffey's predictions proved accurate. The killer struck again on the anniversary of the first murder, reinforcing the urgency of the investigation. The pressure on the detectives was palpable, with each passing day bringing the fear of another innocent life being taken. As the investigation unfolded, the detectives faced an immense challenge of handling the media frenzy and public reaction. Dark-haired women changed their appearance out of fear. Serial killer David Berkowitz, aka the Son of Sam, was thought to be targeting women in New York City who had long, dark hair. The very real fear of being a target led many women to cut their hair short, dye it, or wear wigs. In the end, the relentless pursuit of justice led to the arrest of David Berkowitz on August 10, 1977. The investigation, however, was not without its controversies. Infighting over promotions and rewards created tensions among the investigators, but Joe Coffey stood tall as he cared more about justice than promotions. The Gotti Arrest In the streets of New York City, a relentless pursuit was underway. Joe Coffey, a seasoned law enforcement official, found himself on the trail of one of the most notorious mobsters of his time, John Gotti. The year was 1988 and Gotti's swaggering presence loomed large over the organized crime in New York, especially after orchestrating the demise of Paul Castellano to assume the control of the Gambino crime family. Coffey, a man driven by a sense of justice and a desire to dismantle the organized crime networks plaguing his city, had a particular interest in Gotti. As the sun dipped, Coffey and his team closed in on their target. John Gotti was arrested. Gotti, even when his hands were cuffed behind his back, exuded a peculiar mix of arrogance and defiance. Even in custody, he remained the epitome of a streetwise thug, a persona he cultivated and relished in the public eye. The arrest was not a mere procedural formality. It was a culmination of relentless efforts, fueled by Gotti's audacious displays in the media. Every appearance of the Teflon Don only served to fortify Coffey's determination to bring him to justice. The arrest scene was not just a moment of reckoning for Gotti, but also a testament to Coffey's unyielding dedication. The unmarked car pulled up near the Ravenite Social Club in Little Italy, where Gotti, surrounded by detectives, was confronted by the long arm of the law. The arrest occurred during what was known as Capo Night at the club. During the frisking process, Coffey's keen instincts kicked in, as he discovered something metallic in Gotti's belt, prompting a pointed interrogation. Gotti, with his quick-witted charisma, claimed that it was his belt buckle. Coffey, undeterred, proceeded to handcuff him and pull the gun off him, marking the end of Gotti's reign as a free man. As the news of Gotti's arrest reverberated throughout the city, it sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld. For Coffey, it was a moment of triumph, a step closer to dismantling the powerful criminal empire that had eluded justice for far too long. The arrest of John Gotti wasn't just about a single man facing the consequences of his actions. It was about delivering a blow to the heart of organized crime in New York. The arrest unfolded against the backdrop of Gotti's legal troubles. The mobster had been implicated in the shooting of John O'Connor, a key figure in the ongoing investigations into mob-influenced unions. Gotti's confidence as he was led to the station for questioning was unwavering. Three to one, I beat this crap, Gotti said. Coffey, however, saw beyond the bravado. He saw a man whose arrogance fueled the fire of law enforcement's determination. Gotti's public persona, who seemed untouchable, only intensified Coffey's resolve. As the unmarked car made its way through the city streets, it was a pivotal moment in the ongoing battle against organized crime in New York City. The arrest was not an isolated event. 
It was a chapter in a larger narrative of law enforcement struggle against the formidable forces of the Mafia. Gotti's legal battles were numerous, including trials related to the O'Connor shooting and a RICO charge stemming from an armored car heist. Despite the mounting pressure, Gotti adhered to the Mafia code of Omerta, refusing to cooperate with law enforcement. Coffey, however, believed that Gotti's courtroom victories were not simply a result of legal prowess. He suspected foul play, pointing fingers at potential case-fixing and jury manipulation. The Gambino boss seemed to have an uncanny ability to slip through the fingers of justice, earning him the moniker Teflon Don from the media. In the aftermath of Gotti's arrest, the landscape of organized crime underwent a seismic shift. The Gambino crime family was weakened and the once mighty Colombo crime family crumbled, leaving only three dominant mafia families in New York, Genovese, a leaderless Gambino, and the Lucchese. The power dynamics were shifting and law enforcement, spearheaded by Joe Coffey and the Organized Crime Task Force, played a pivotal role in disrupting the invincible criminal hierarchies. The Retirement Betrayal In the dimly lit room, Joe Coffey sat amidst the buzz of congratulatory chatter, the clinking of glasses, and the occasional outburst of laughter. The retirement party thrown in his honor by federal prosecutor Rudy Giuliani was in full swing. Colleagues and law enforcement officials filled the space, expressing their gratitude for Coffey's decade-long dedication to solving organized crime cases in the heart of New York City. As he soaked in the accolades and well-wishes, little did Joe Coffey know that betrayal loomed in the corners of his celebration. His decision to retire on that March evening in 1985 marked the end of a storied career, but it also set the stage for an unexpected turn of events that would cast shadows on his legacy. That night was meant to be a culmination of Coffey's achievements, a recognition of his pivotal role in high-profile cases. Amidst the celebration, however, there lingered an undercurrent of tension. Chief of Detectives Nick Castro, a figure with whom Coffey had clashed in the past, observed from a distance. The source of their friction was a blend of political rivalry and personal animosity that added an edge to the otherwise festive atmosphere. As the night progressed, a plaque from the FBI was notably absent in the lineup of commendations presented to Coffey. The omission raised eyebrows, but the real shock came later when Coffey discovered the unsettling truth. His phone records had been subpoenaed by the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. The betrayal ran deep. The FBI, an agency that should have been an ally in the fight against organized crime, had turned its investigative lens on Coffey. The trigger? A casual mention of his name in a bug planted in the Palma Boys Social Club. Tony Rabito, a capo from the Genovese crime family, had inadvertently dragged Coffey into the crosshairs of the FBI. The revelation left Coffey grappling with a sense of betrayal and disillusionment. The very agency he had worked alongside had scrutinized his actions, sowing seeds of mistrust that would shape his post-retirement perspective. The tension escalated further when, during his retirement party, the FBI hesitated to present him with a plaque. The reason was said to be in the book titled The Vatican Connection by Richard Hammer, implied that the Bureau had failed to follow leads developed by Coffey. The incident underscored the complexities and mistrust that now colored Coffey's relationship with the FBI. The retirement party, initially a joyous occasion, had become a battlefield of conflicting emotions. For Coffey, the atmosphere was changed with a mix of celebration and resentment. Yet, true to his resilient nature, Coffey soldiered on and kept his cool. Despite the setbacks, life after retirement beckoned. Joe Coffey joined forces with Ron Goldstock, embarking on a new chapter in private investigations. The transition allowed him to channel his expertise into uncovering truths beyond the confines of official law enforcement. One such case led Coffey to Houston, Texas, where he and a colleague delved into a real estate investment firm entangled with drug-related issues. The pursuit of justice, it seemed, was a flame that continued to burn, even beyond the official badge and precinct walls. Yet the scars of betrayal remained. The bitterness that had seeped into Coffey's professional journey cast shadows on his perception of the institutions he had served. The FBI, once a trusted partner, now stood as a symbol of a broken trust and unanswered questions. As time passed, Coffey's determination to move forward did not waver. His personal life became a sanctuary, offering moments of solace amidst the tumult of post-retirement revelations. With his wife Pat and his daughter Kathleen and a brother Tom, Coffey found refuge in family bonds that provided stability and support.